Good day everyone. Welcome back to my trading series entitled Understanding EMV. This is the 26th video in the series and in this video we will be looking at the 14th and final step of the EMV transaction. Okay. So let's get straight into it. As usual we're going to do a recap. So we know but the scenario is Bob is looking to buy a pair of socks. He's at his local comic book store. Uh, he selected the pay he wants. He's at the till. The cashier has run up the purchase. Um, and we are now ready to, to, to actually pay for the goods, right? So the first thing we do is obviously agree on the technology. So Bob has an EMV capable card. The pause device at the store is EMV capable. So it's a match made in heaven. So technology selection done. We've selected EMV for this transaction. Now that we know it's an EMV transaction, the cards have been inserted into the pause device. It, it powers up the chip. We now find that there are two virtual cards, two applications on the card that may be used for this purchase. Uh, and so we have a decision to make and Bob opts to use his primary virtual card, his primary application, which is his credit card. Now that we've established which card, which virtual card will be used for the transaction, uh, the virtual card and the terminal have a conversation, the exchange of information. Okay, uh, we didn't go into a phase uh, called card authentication methodology, CAM, or offline data authentication, ODA, which takes form of, in, in this day and age, DDA or CDA. And in this, in this phase, basically the terminal undergoes some processing just to verify that the card being used is a, it's, it's a genuine authentic card and it's not a card that you know where there's been an attempt to counterfeit it. Once we're happy that the card is genuine, uh, we then go through a phase called processing restrictions. And in this phase, we establish whether the transaction itself is valid, you know, whether the conditions, <coughs> excuse me, present in the transaction are valid. Okay, once we're happy with that, uh, and now it's our turn to ensure that the cardholder is authentic. So we verify the cardholder. We go through the cardholder verification phase. Uh, and in our example, we use, if I'm not mistaken, it was an offline pin that was verified by the card. So once we verified that, you know, the person standing there holding the card is actually Bob, the terminal now, you know, has sufficient information for it to start its terminal risk management process. Uh, and and in this step, you know what it's trying to do is trying to establish, you know, how should this transaction proceed? Right? Should we decline it offline? Should we go online, or, or you know, to ask the issuer host for further input, or or, or should we just approve it offline? Uh, and as a result of this terminal risk management, the terminal goes into a phase called terminal action analysis, and you know, in this phase, it basically formulates a request to the card asking for a particular course of action, right? So it'll say, uh, you know, uh, Ms. Ms. Card, please, uh, based on my terminal risk management, I believe that this transaction should decline offline, or we need to go online for the issuer host to give us more information, or, you know, I'm happy for it to approve offline, right? Uh, this is just a request, right? And the card pays attention to the request because it's it, it, it has to, uh, because it's bound by the golden rule of EMV, right? Which 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 states that the strictest rule applies. So it will it will take it will accept the terminal's request, but before it makes a decision, it does its own risk management and it does its own you know, card action analysis. Uh, uh, you know, using data, using a, a perspective that may be different from the terminal's viewpoint, uh, and and so between its its independent risk management and the terminal's independent risk management, the card will now go into a decision-making phase known as first-gen AC. Okay. Now, if the card chose, or you know, based on the factors in the, in, in the transaction, chose to approve or decline a transaction offline, then the transaction ends here. <clears throat> However, for the purposes of our training, we, we we made it such that the transaction was going to go online for additional input from the issuer host, just so that we could train, for tra just so that we could track for training purposes the 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 full number of steps that that could possibly exist in an EMV transaction. Right. So 
be because the card respondent would say, let's go online and ARQC, the terminal, you know, creates the IC8588 message, it attaches the relevant information required in the message, and it sends it online to the issuer host system. The issuer host system receives it, and it does some verifications and validations in the background, and it responds to an issue decision, right? Uh, saying, you know, uh, in our example, it, it responded with, let's approve this transaction. So this is transmitted back to the terminal, back on an ISO 8583 message, but uh, this will be a response message now, and it will go to the terminal. The terminal will then kick off the second gen AC phase of the transaction, and what it does basically is, instead of doing full terminal risk management uh, again, what it basically does is that it, it looks at what the, the ARC, the field 39 response, or the approval decision, the, or, or the issue decision, and it will basically formulate its request to the card based on this. So in our case, the issuer host said, let's approve the transaction. So the term will simply tell the card, uh, you know, my suggestion or my request is that, you know, could you please generate a TC? Could you please approve the transaction? Okay. The card uh, will take that recommendation in the account, but it also does its own processing. It, it will do ARPC validation, and then it, it, it will come to a decision where, uh, you know, where, where we make a final decision, right? So it, 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 in this case, we've approved the transaction. The, the, so, so the issuer host has, has asked for an approval. The terminal has submitted the request for an approval, and the card has responded with a TC indicating that, okay, we've approved the transaction. But before we can finalize, we now go into a script processing phase. So I had the issuer sent down any issuer scripts on that ISO 8583 response message, the card would now apply those scripts to itself at this point in time, right? And, and these scripts are basically used to make changes to the, to the on-card parameters. Once the scripts have been processed, okay, now we are at a point where, you know, where we can finally complete the transaction. And so that's what we are going to be discussing, you know, very briefly today, this video. So let's get straight into that. So let's talk a bit about transaction completion. Transaction completion refers to the valid completion and termination of the session between the car and terminal. So what basically happens here, when we say the, trans the transaction completes, we're saying that all of the necessary data exchange and processing has taken place by the card and the terminal. Uh, at this point, there's nothing more to be done. So the terminal will prompt the card holder you know, or the attendant to remove the card from the device, from the pause machine. Okay. Once the card is removed, or, or, or just prior to the card being removed, when, when, when the notification is, is, is given to remove the card, the, the terminal actually stops supplying power to the card, right? So the card becomes inert. It, it, it's a computer, but it's a computer without a power supply anymore, so it, 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 it goes dormant, right? At this point in time, the customer is, is, is you know, is free to pocket the card and, you know, uh, basically walk out of the store. With, with the goods that was purchased. Uh, just bear in mind that by virtue of this transaction taking place, all of these 14 steps and, and the fact that we are in a transaction completion state where we've said, you know, the transaction was approved. Uh, this is actually a legal agreement, right, between the merchant, the shop, right, and the cardholder, Bob, that as a result of, of this transaction taking place, the, the merchant now has... Uh, an agreement for him to 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 pull the transaction amount from the cardholder's account. So again, obviously, it's, it's not directly done. It's not like the merchant will, will, will access the, the cardholder's account to withdraw the money. Uh, there is a settlement process that happens between between the merchants and the banks uh, and and the cardholders. But basically, this transaction, this completed transaction, is a legal agreement allowing for the transfer of funds to happen out of the cardholder's account and into the merchant's account. Right, so remember we said that Bob has now put his 
Cardinal's world is ready to walk out. Is is you know he's, he's, he can he can pick up his, his his goods and walk at any time. But but usually you know as as part of completion, what happens uh, is that the POS device will print a receipt for the transaction. Right now, you know in this day and age, it's 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 quite commonplace to have your your POS machines you know uh, give you an option to email the receipt to you to your email address. Uh, but if, if, if you look at the traditional POS device, standalone POS devices, you know, the ones with the printer roll in it, uh, yeah, these would these these just print the receipt out on on a piece of paper. And the receipts look look very similar to what's on the screen right now. Right. So generally two receipts are printed. So one is a a customer copy and this is the one that the the, the attendant or the teller will, will hand over to the card holder uh, to to retain as proof of purchase. Uh, the other one is, is is a copy that the merchant will retain, right, for historic reasons. Uh, generally speaking, both of them are very similar, you know, that they have, in some regards, exactly the same information. So you're going to find like the transaction amount and the transaction date and transaction time and the card number and things like that will be sort of exactly the same. But you find that on the merchant, copy usually there are few additional pieces of data that, that may not be present on the customer copy excuse me right uh, you'll notice that I've, I've also got uh, like for example things are unpardoned this this doesn't generally happen it's there's always a pci dss component that requires the pen to be boss i've just put it in here you know just to sort of highlight that that's the full pen, but yeah, you, what, you generally, what you generally find also as well is on the merchant copy, you tend to have a bit more EMV data uh, than you do on, on, on the customer copy. In, in this particular example, it, it, it's the same, but but I've seen copies of, of, of customer receipts in a way. A lot of this AC information and ICC data, and in some cases, even the TSI and stuff isn't, isn't present on the customer copy. And so, I mean, so what, the point I'm trying to make is it will vary you know, from bank to bank, from terminal to terminal, from region to region, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to cover receipts in detail in this training session. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got a separate training session. I've got a separate training series for that, uh, which, which I'll, I'll obviously have to build from scratch from my, from my notes. Uh, but yeah, so if, if I ever have the, the time one day, uh, yeah, if, 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 if I have the time and if there is a demand for it, yeah, maybe one day I'll put it up, but yeah, probably not anytime soon. Okay. Uh, all right. So now where we are is this is the, this is not formally the end of the EMV transaction cycle, right? Uh, and, and, and I think it's important just to reflect that in the time it takes for you to complete a, tra a typical transaction. At a merchant, you know, if it's offline transaction, it'll take two or three seconds. If it's an online transaction, it'll take you know maybe up to ten seconds. But in in this in the in the ten seconds, there's a, an enormous amount of processing that actually takes place you know, between the card, the terminal, switching systems, issuer host systems, etc. So I think it's you know it's it's something we should be aware of. Uh, it, it is it it is quite impressive uh, to know that how much of security is built into such an efficient mechanism. Right, so yeah, this is the end of the EMV transaction flow. Uh, we've just finished. We've just finished step fourteen, which is the tr transaction completion. Bob is happy. He's walked off with his card and receipt in his pockets, and his new pair of socks in his hand. Uh, and we are finally done with the EMV transaction flow. Okay. Uh, in the next video, uh, we will be looking, we will still be under the EMV acquiring section, but we will be looking nextly at EMV fallback and then later on in the, there will be a video touching on in some of the basic spies, so 8583. Okay, and then, you know, once, once EMV acquiring is done, we've got, I think, lifecycle management. There's a few videos to go through there, and we should be very close to done with the entire series at that point. Okay, so uh, thank you for bearing with me so far, and I look forward to catching you guys in my next one. Uh, so yeah, uh, cheers everyone, uh, take care, and